Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're continuing the Conquest of Shuhan Let's Talk Lore series with episode 11, titled Liu Shan's Legacy. Before we get started, here's the answer to our trivia question from the end of our last episode, and be sure to stay tuned until the end of this episode for a brand new trivia question. Now last time we left off, as chaos descended on the city of Chengdu on the footsteps of Zhonghui's failed rebellion, by the time army inspector Wei Guan regained control of the Wei army and finally stopped the chaos within the city, much of it was in ruins. Former Shu Han officials, especially those that were with Jiang Wei and Zhong Hui, such as Liu Shan's crown prince, Liu Xuan, General Zhang Yi, and officials Jiang Bin and Jiang Xian, were all killed. For those curious, Jiang Bin and Jiang Xian were the two sons of the late Shu Han prime minister, Jiang Wan. Furthermore, Jiang Wei's entire family would also be killed as his estate was targeted by the Wei troops soon after his death. Now, there is a popular story that is sourced from a book called Shu Ji that the Wei general, Pang Hui, targeted and killed Guan Yu's remaining descendants in Chengdu in order to avenge for his father's death back at Fan Castle. But historically speaking, this was very unlikely. First off, the only surviving descendant of Guan Yu at this time was his grandson, Guan Yi. Looking through the historical records at the time, Guan Yi's death was not recorded by Chen Shou, the author of the Records of the Three Kingdom, and a contemporary of this event, even though everyone else who died during this incident was recorded down in the records. Furthermore, Shu Ji also made a claim that Pang Hui would end up digging his father's body from Chengdu's grave and move it back to the city of Ye for a proper burial. And this is clearly just incorrect, as Pang De was executed and killed in Fan Castle, and given that Guan Yu was defeated and captured not long after, there was just no way that Pang De would have been shipped back to Chengdu for a burial. So for this reason, it's most likely the story involving Pang Hui in Shu Ji is a ahistorical folklore, especially considering that the author of Shu Ji in Wang Yin was an Eastern Jin Dynasty official who wasn't even born yet in 264. Now, with Zhonghui's death, the command of the Wei army fell under Wei Guan. And the important thing with this is that right after Zhonghui's death, elements within the Wei army that were friendly with Deng Ai made the argument that Deng Ai's arrest was mostly a part of Zhonghui's rebellion. So now with Zhonghui's rebellion crushed, Deng Ai should be freed. And as Deng Ai was sent away just two days ago, his prison convoy was still near Chengdu. So it was definitely possible for Wei Guan to stop the transport and bring Deng Ai back to Chengdu as a freed man. However, Wei Guan didn't do this for two reasons. First, Wei Guan was worried that Deng Ai would fault him for his wrongful arrest as after all, it was Wei Guan who had personally arrested Deng Ai. Second, Wei Guan enjoyed being in command of the army. If Deng Ai returned, then Deng Ai would outrank him. This was important because the reward for the conquest of Shu Han was still on the table, and it was definitely going to be lofty with the promise of promotions and nobility titles. So if Wei Guan remained as the highest commanding officer at the end of the affair, he would surely receive the highest reward. Therefore, now with Zhonghui dead, all Wei Guan had to do was to remove Deng Ai from the picture as well to make this a reality. This meant not only was Wei Guan not going to halt the prison transport, he was not going to even allow Deng Ai to make it back to Luoyang alive, as Deng Ai would most likely be pardoned upon his return, given Zhonghui's rebellion. And thus, Wei Guan ended up sending a small detachment of troops led by Officer Tian Xu to track down and kill Deng Ai and the entire prison convoy in secret. Tian Xu was more than happy to carry out this sinister task because Tian Xu hated Deng Ai. As a member of Deng Ai's army that took part in the hike, Tian Xu had previously suggested to Deng Ai to rest their army at Jiangyou prior to the Battle of Mianzhu, 
as he believed that their army was simply too tired to assault Zhuge Zhan's defensive position. This clearly went against Deng Ai's plan to strike swiftly at all costs, so Deng Ai had originally wanted to execute Tian Xu to make a statement out of him so that the rest of the army would be more committed to the attack. Luckily, Tian Xu was spared from death at the last moment, but Deng Ai still left him behind in prison in Mianzhu. And when Zhong Hui's army arrived later, Tian Xu was pardoned and reinstated to his officer position, as in Zhong Hui's mind, an enemy of Deng Ai was clearly going to be a friend. Now under Wei Guan, Tian Xu would be utilized in this exact same manner, as his troop would soon track down and kill Deng Ai, Deng Ai's son Deng Zhong, and the rest of the prison transport, as in the span of just a few short days, the three generals, all with ambitious dreams of their own, in Deng Ai, Zhong Hui, and Jiang Wei, would all be tragically killed as the Wei military campaign against the Kingdom of Shuhan would finally come to an end. Wei Guan, as the top Wei officer to come out of this entire affair, ended up humbly refusing the nobility title promotion offered by the court, as he would ultimately end up replacing Zhong Hui as the new general who stabilizes the West in charge of the Wei Western forces in Chang'an. Wei Guan would continue to enjoy a long and prosperous political career during the Jin Dynasty, until eventually becoming the imperial tutor for Emperor Sima Zhong. And for those who have watched the Eight Princes Let's Talk Lore series, you might remember that Wei Guan was one of the two co regent alongside Sima Liang to guide Emperor Sima Zhong. But when Empress Jia Nanfeng seized power, both he and Sima Liang would end up being killed by Empress Jia Nanfeng's pawn, Sima Wei, in a power grab that would ultimately kick off the Eight Princes conflict. Now, bring our story back to the end of Shu Han we must also talk about Emperor Liu Shan's fate. Once order was finally returned to Chengdu, the Wei court would force Liu Shan and his family to leave the Shu lands for good in March of 264. They would be relocated to live in the Wei capital city of Luoyang as political prisoners, as Liu Shan ended up with only a duke title of Anle Xian Gong, or the Duke of Anle County. Despite the county-level title, Liu Shan was allowed to live in luxury, as the Wei court provided him with an annual stipend of 10,000 households and gave him 100 servants and maids to take care of his every need. This, of course, also led to the famous story involving Sima Zhao and Liu Shan, where after Liu Shan arrived in Luoyang, Sima Zhao hosted a banquet in Liu Shan's honor along with most of the surrendered former Shu Han officials that now work within the Wei court. During this banquet, Sima Zhao intentionally had the court musicians play music from the Shu region to spark a sense of nostalgia amongst the former Shu Han officials. While some of these former officials would become overwhelmed in sadness and even burst into tears upon hearing these familiar chords of their former homeland and kingdom, Liu Shan was unbothered as he continued to enjoy the feast. So when Sima Zhao asked Liu Shan directly if he missed the Shu land, Liu Shan famously answered that life is comfortable and enjoyable here, so no, he did not miss the Shu land. And when former Shu Han official Xi Zheng heard Liu Shan's response, he quietly approached his former emperor and whispered to Liu Shan that if Sima Zhao should ask this question again in the future, make sure to appear saddened and say that he misses the Shu land because his father's grave was there, and perhaps in Sima Zhao's good grace, Liu Shan might be allowed to return to the Shu land instead of continuing to live in Luoyang as a political hostage. And sure enough, near the end of the banquet, Sima Zhao would ask Liu Shan the same question again. This time, Liu Shan answered, following Xi Zheng's instructions, but upon hearing this, Sima Zhao laughed and said, why does this feel like something Xi Zheng would say? Befuddled, Liu Shan gasped and asked Sima Zhao how he knew it was something Xi Zheng had taught him to say, and laughing at Liu Shan's simple-mindedness, Sima Zhao became certain that Liu Shan was never going to be a threat as Liu Shan got to live out his days in peace as the duke, 
until his death of old age in 271. His sixth son, Liu Xun, would inherit his duke title and continue to live under the protection of the Jin dynasty until his death during the fall of Luoyang in 311 at the hands of the nomadic invasion that would ultimately end the Western Jin dynasty. Now, to be clear, while Liu Shan's story of not missing the Shu land would be forever immortalized in Chinese idiom of Le Bu Si Shu, the story itself is likely a ahistorical one, as it only appears in a book called Han Jin Chun Qiu, or the annuals of the Han Jin period that was written during the Eastern Jin dynasty. And one of the main purpose of this book was to play up the legitimacy of the Shu Han regime, as sort of a spite for the current regent that was dominating the Jin court. And because of this, there was an intentional effort by the author to cast Liu Shan in a bad light, oftentimes making him appear almost as a gullible fool, to play up his role in ending this legitimate dynasty. So while the exact story behind Le Bu Si Shu is probably made up, it still largely represented Liu Shan's acceptance of the situation and the lack of effort to restore the Han. Now, before we end our series on the conquest of Shu Han, there is just one last story to tell, as it will involve the Wu reinforcement and the impact of the conquest of Shu Han on the kingdom of Wu at large. So come back next time, as we'll be wrapping up our series tomorrow with episode 12, titled The Impact on Wu, so hopefully you all have enjoyed this episode enough to consider subscribing to the channel for more content on Three Kingdoms history, or simply support the channel by leaving a comment below, or just by hitting the like button. And as always, I'll see you all next time. Bye!